Like a lot of people, I grew up thinking that all silent films were black and white. But for many early film pioneers, colour was the goal. By the mid-1920s, up to 80% of the films released were coloured in some way. They were a dazzling mix of tints and tones and colours applied with stencils that glowed on the big screen like stained glass windows. Today, documentary filmmakers regularly colourise archive footage in the hope that it feels, well, more immediate and relatable to jaded 21st century tastes. But filmmakers were busy colourising a hundred plus years ago. They were tricking our eyes and brains into seeing the world in different ways. This wonderful world of early colour brought both incredible naturalism and extraordinary abstraction. It was like 1960s psychedelia had arrived decades early. Multiple colour film processes were developed during the first 30 or so years of film. This is where colour is photographically recorded and reproduced. One of the most notable of these was kinema colour, invented in 1906 by one of the greatest and most creative of British film pioneers, George Albert Smith. But my greatest love is for those early films whose colours were created with rather more artifice, with colour applied directly to the film print. The most prevalent of these techniques was tinting, which involved dipping the black and white film in a dye bath and staining the emulsion. Sometimes an entire film would be dyed a single colour. But most rewarding, at least for me, is when a film comprises shots tinted in different colours, often coded to assist the audience on their journey, both spatially and emotionally. Nighttime scenes were often blue, interiors amber, fires and fury were red, forests green, and romance pink or lavender. But the rules were not exactly hard and fast. Another tool in the filmmaker and distributor's colour palette was toning. This required a chemical reaction to replace the silver image in the film emulsion with one of several coloured metal compounds. Iron ferrocyanide was probably used to create the blue of this delightful public health film produced by Bermondsey Borough Council. Tinting and toning could also be brought together to create some extraordinary effects, such as the amber tint and blue tone used for some of the night scenes in Hitchcock's The Lodger. Accurately reproducing these colour combinations when the film was first restored by the BFI National Archive defied our technologies, our budgets and our health and safety regulations. And it wasn't until the advent of digital restoration techniques that this was possible once again. One of the most enduring success stories in British film and television has been natural history filmmaking. Oliver Pike was a pioneer of natural history cinematography, developing groundbreaking techniques to capture his subjects in their natural habitats. When you look at the black and white footage of this film that Pike shot in 1908, his technical skill is remarkable, but it feels a far cry from the intimacy and realism we'd expect from David Attenborough. Shot by Pike the following year, this film is another matter altogether. The colour lifts and transforms the film, engaging us in a completely different way. This is an incredibly sophisticated use of stencil colouring, subtly attempting to reproduce the colours of the natural world. Colour had been applied by hand directly onto film prints from the earliest days, but it wasn't long before Pathé introduced its stencil colour process in 1905. It was painstaking, highly skilled work, and at its peak, 300 women were employed at Pathé's workshop in Vincennes. With all this colour around, why do people today assume that all silent films were black and white? Well, there's a good reason. 35mm silent films were shot on unstable nitrate film stock. Unless preserved in optimum conditions, they can deteriorate quickly. We have records of silent films arriving at the archive in the 30s and 40s that were already decomposing. To ensure their long-term preservation, from the 50s onwards, archivists copied these deteriorating films onto more stable black and white safety stock. And that's how they were then seen. So if they had once looked like jewels, the only place you could see the colours glowing would have been by examining the original nitrate print. Our restoration of early colour doesn't just rely on original film prints, but often on records of the colours that have been kept. 
Restoring the complex rainbow of tints and tones in the Great White Silence would not have been possible without them. I find it almost impossible now to imagine the film in black and white. All of the clips you've seen are from films preserved by the BFI National Archive, and a major strand of our restoration and digitization program is returning the original colours to silent films and thereby changing understanding. Fortunately, we still preserve many original coloured nitrate film prints, and all of them are kept in optimum preservation conditions, but most are yet to be restored or digitised. I'll leave you with one of my favourites, some more remarkable Pathé colour stenciling. So, here's Angkor Wat in Cambodia, filmed in 1925 and looking even more extraordinary than reality. <laughs> <laughs> 